In the previous lecture, we have discussed the origin of magnetism in transition metals and briefly looked at its interplay with the band structure. Now, what I would like to do is to look a bit more closely at the crystal symmetries and see how they influence magnetism. We will see that there are two main consequences, the orbital quenching in cubic crystal and the emergence of magnetocrystalline anisotropy. I will conclude this second lecture by discussing about novel phenomena happening at interfaces, like the Rashba effect and the joseinsky moria interaction. Let's move on. First of all, let's examine the crystal field felt by the electron orbitals in a real crystal. For this discussion, we are going to consider the simplest crystal structures adopted by cobalt, iron, and nickel. The three materials adopt a closed packed structure, BCC, HCP, and FCC. The most obvious thing you can say is that this environment is not spherically symmetric. So, if I want to represent atomic orbitals in such a crystal, the spherical harmonics are not suitable anymore. In other words, I need to recombine these spherical harmonics into a new basis that respects the crystal symmetry of my BCC, HCC, or FCC lattice. These new orbitals are called cubic harmonics. This is something I briefly mentioned in the previous lecture, without paying too much attention to it. But if you look carefully at the structure of these harmonics, you realize that they possess a vanishing orbital angular momentum. For instance, if you take the dxy orbital, it is composed of the y2-2 and the y22 spherical harmonics. Just to remind you, the first number is the magnetic quantum number, while the second quantum number is the projection of the orbital angular momentum on the quantization axis. So in the case of the dxy orbital, the two projections compensate each other, resulting in a vanishing orbital angular momentum. This explains why the orbital angular momentum does not participate to the total magnetic moment in transition metals. There is a second important consequence of this crystal field. Although cubic harmonics are better suited to describe cubic crystal structures, they may not all be degenerating energy. For example, if you consider an octahedral environment where the central atom is surrounded by six nearest neighbors forming an octahedron, the dxy, dyz, and dzx orbitals will have a lower energy than the dz square and dx square minus y square orbitals. This is because the lobes of the dxy, dyz, and dzx orbitals extend in between the nearest neighbors why the lobes of the dz square on the x square minus y square orbitals directly overlap with these nearest neighbors. So the former experience much less electrostatic repulsion than the latter. Using group theory designation, the dxy, dyz, and dzx orbitals form what is called the T2g state, which is a threefold degenerate state and the dz square and dx square minus y square orbitals form the eg state, which is twofold degenerate. The energy difference between these two levels is called the crystal field splitting, as it is governed by the crystal structure. Now, if I change the symmetry of the environment, the energy landscape will also change. In a tetrahedral arrangement, the dz square and dx square minus y square orbitals have lower energy than the dxy, dyz, and dzx orbitals. In this crystal, the dz square and dx square minus y square orbitals form the E states, while the dxy, dyz, and dzx orbitals form the T2 state. Let us carry on our exploration and come back to the octahedral environment. If I pull the bottom and top ions away from the central plane, the energy of the orbitals that lie out of plane 
will tend to decrease while the energy of the orbitals lying in the plane will tend to slightly increase. In the limit of the two-dimensional square lattice, the orbitals are completely rearranged in terms of energy and their degeneracy is further reduced. The reason why orbital rearrangement as a function of the crystal structure is important is because depending on the crystal structure, different orbitals will contribute to magnetism. This is particularly striking in the case of properties emerging from spin orbit coupling. Previously, we have seen that spin orbit coupling mixes the orbital character of the wave function with its spin character. Therefore, through spin orbit coupling, one expects that the spin properties of a material will be influenced by the crystal structure. The most obvious manner crystal symmetries influence the magnetic properties is through the magnetocrystalline anisotropy. Because the crystal does not have spherical symmetry, the total energy of the system depends on the direction of the magnetization with respect to the crystallographic axis. For instance, if you consider a BCC crystal like iron, having the magnetization pointing along the 001 direction or along the 110 direction results in a different overall energy. Therefore, it may be more energetically favorable for the magnetization to point either along 001 or 110 direction. The magnetization direction for which the energy is minimized is called the easy axis, and the magnetization direction for which the energy is maximum is called the hard axis. Of, of course, you could have several easy axes or several hard axes in a crystal. Where does this anisotropy come from? In the previous slides, we have seen that the crystal symmetries leaves the degeneracy of the cubic orbitals. In a sense, the information about the crystal symmetries gets imprinted on the orbitals. Since these orbitals couple to the spin moment through spin orbit coupling, the consequence is that the total energy of the system depends on the magnetization direction. The magnetic anisotropy energy is usually defined as the energy difference between the case where the magnetization lies along the hard axis and the case where the magnetization lies along the easy axis. Let's say a few words about the theory of magnetocrystalline anisotropy. Using the second order perturbation theory, you obtain this formula. And what you realize is that the and isotropy energy is proportional to the square of the spin orbit coupling strength. Since magnetism is mostly carried by d electrons, which by the way possess the larger spin orbit coupling strength, magnetocrystalline anisotropy is dominated by the d electrons. And because it comes from spin orbit coupling, this effect involves a complex mixture of spin mixing and orbital mixing. A simple model has been put forward to get some rough understanding of the physical origin of magnetocrystalline anisotropy. If you consider that one spin subband is full, let's say the spin down, it means that the second order perturbation only involves one species of electrons, spin up here. This simplifies the problem and one can obtain a simple expression of the anisotropy energy. Now what is interesting is that this expression of the anisotropy energy that I obtain in the second order perturbation theory can be related to the anisotropy of the orbital moment that I calculated through the first order perturbation theory. Therefore, one arrives at Bruno's formula that relates the magnetocrystalline anisotropy with the anisotropy of the orbital moment. This is a very powerful formula that has influenced many research works in the past few decades. It actually points out that the magnetic anisotropy is expected to be very small in the bulk of transition metals. Indeed, since the cubic environment of these transition metals is not too far from the spherical symmetry, one obtains a very small orbital moment anisotropy, and therefore a small magnetocrystalline anisotropy of the order of a few microelectron volt per atom.
The reason why magnetocrystalline anisotropy is not too large in 3D transition metals is because the closed pack structure has a very high symmetry. Actually, things become really interesting when we lower the symmetry and consider a surface or an interface. If I take a square lattice of ions, the electrons whose orbitals are confined in the plane feel the crystal field of the square lattice, and therefore the out-of-plane orbital moment is quenched. On the contrary, the electrons occupying orbitals that have lobes out of the plane do not experience the crystal field and therefore the in-plane orbital moment does not vanish. You directly see that because the orbital moment out of plane is different from the orbital moment in the plane, I expect magnetocrystalline anisotropy. In the example shown here, the magnetization prefers to point in the plane because the orbital moment in the plane is larger. The magnetocrystalline anisotropy is expected to be much larger at interfaces and surfaces because the energy difference between in-plane and out-of-plane orbitals is much more pronounced. And this is what is observed experimentally. Perpendicular magnetic anisotropy has been observed in many transition metal multilayers, such as gold cobalt multilayers or platinum cobalt multilayers. The reported magnetocrystalline anisotropy can be as high as a few milli electron volt per atom, so a thousand times larger than bulk anisotropy. To understand the origin of such an isotropy, the Bruno model was used. In this graph, I report the experimental results obtained by Veller and coworkers in 1995 on gold cobalt gold multilayers. It displays the spin moment the spin anisotropy and the orbital anisotropy as a function of the cobalt thickness measured by X-ray circular dichroism. What you see is that the spin moment doesn't change much when varying the thickness, which means essentially that the magnetization remains constant. Then you see that the spin anisotropy is also not very important the spin density is about the same whether you put the magnetization in the plane or perpendicular to the plane. Now what is more interesting is that the orbital moment does show a much larger anisotropy. This is consistent with Bruno's formula that states that perpendicular anisotropy is associated with a sizable orbital anisotropy. And you see that the orbital moment is larger for perpendicular orientation than for in-plane orientation of the magnetization, which is consistent with perpendicular anisotropy. I'd like to conclude this discussion by mentioning that perpendicular magnetic anisotropy does not only happen at transition metal interfaces. One can also observe it at the interface between a 3D transition metal and an oxide. This is an experiment that was originally done by Bernard Denis and Bernard Ronmack from Spintech in France. They took a bilayer, say cobalt covered with aluminum, and started exposing this structure to oxygen plasma. Depending on the duration of the exposure, it was possible to obtain a very large magnetic anisotropy. Now, if you perform X ray photoemission spectroscopy, you realize that the maximum perpendicular magnetic anisotropy is reached when the oxygen is exactly present at the interface. If you do not oxidize enough or oxidize too much, then the anisotropy is weaker. One can understand this effect by considering the role of orbital hybridization between the 3D orbitals of the ferromagnets and the PZ orbital of oxygen. Oxygen brings its PZ orbitals at the interface that enhances the perpendicular orbital moment and therefore enhances the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. Now, before concluding this lecture, I will talk about two important phenomena arising from interfacial spin orbit coupling, the Rajba effect and the jaworski moria interaction. Those two effects have major consequences in magnetic materials. They give rise to spin orbit torque, spin charge conversion, and they stabilize chiral magnetic structures like squamions. What I'm going to show in the next slide 
is that those two phenomena come actually from the fact that close to an interface, block electrons acquire an orbital moment that depends on their propagation direction. Let's see how this works. For the sake of the demonstration, I will first consider a chain of atoms extending along x and possessing both px and pz orbitals. So the pz orbitals look like this, and one can compute their energy dispersion using tight bending method. The px orbitals look like this, and again, I can get the energy dispersion easily. Notice that in this chain, the px and pz orbitals are orthogonal to each other and do not hybridize. If I want them to hybridize, I need to add another chain of atoms, like this one, through which px and pz orbitals can overlap. Let's see what happens when this additional chain possesses pz orbitals. Then the pz orbitals from the top chain can hybridize with the pz orbital from the bottom chain, as well as the px orbitals from the bottom chain. In other words, I have introduced a way to indirectly couple the px and pz orbitals of the bottom chain through the pz orbitals of the top chain. Now, what I want to show is that the mixture between the px and pz orbitals is accompanied by the emergence of non-vanishing orbital moments. To do so, I will introduce this very simple Hamiltonian. The top term in the diagonal is the energy dispersion of the top pz orbitals. The middle term is the energy dispersion of the bottom pz orbitals. And the last term is the dispersion of the px orbitals. In this example, I will assume that these last two dispersions are the same. In real life, this is never the case but it simplifies my calculation without losing the physics. Now, let's look at the off-diagonal elements of my matrix. These elements couple the top chain with the bottom chain. VZZ is the coupling element between the top PZ and bottom PZ orbitals. I can express it explicitly using slater coster parametrization and I obtain something proportional to the cosine of kxa. Here, kx is the momentum along the x direction, and a is the lattice parameter. This cosine comes from the phase of the block states, which simply add up because the hopping integral between the two pz orbitals is specially symmetric. The vzx term is the coupling between the top pz and bottom px orbitals. It is now proportional to the sinus of kxa because the hopping integral between the px and pz orbitals is specially anti-symmetric. I can now extract the eigenstates and eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian and obtain three non-degenerate bands. I will not do that here. This, this would be way too long and cumbersome. I will just consider one band the band with eigen energy epsilon zero. The corresponding state looks like this and is a superposition between the px and pz orbitals of the bottom chain. Now remember, what I want to show is the emergence of this orbital moment. So let us look at the orbital moment of these states. I can take the expectation value of the orbital moment vector L on these states zero and I obtain this expression. Putting everything together, this is what I get. You see that now the orbital moment of the state is aligned along the y direction, so perpendicular to the plane of the orbitals. And it comes directly from the mixture between the px and py orbitals of the bottom chain, mediated by the pz orbitals of the top chain. Another way to put it is that the top chain breaks the inversion symmetry of my system. 
and promotes the emergence of a non-vanishing orbital moment. An important point I'd like to make is that this orbital moment is odd in momentum kx. So if I change the sign of kx, I will change the sign of my orbital moment. This means that at equilibrium, when I sum over all the k states in the brain zone, this orbital moment vanishes. But if I inject a current, or if I create a spatially dependent potential, let's say a domain wall, this orbital moment won't be zero anymore. Okay, we know how to create a non-vanishing orbital moment. What we need now is to turn on the spin orbit coupling, which couple this orbital moment to the spin moment. What you immediately see is that if you create a non-vanishing orbital moment along, say, the y direction, then the spin of the electron will also feel an effective magnetic field on the, along the y direction. In other words, inversion symmetry breaking and spin oblique coupling work together to create a spin texture in momentum space. The reasoning I proposed is based on Px and Pz orbitals but it can be easily extended to all the p and d orbitals as well. So for example, if you mix py and pz orbitals, you get a spin moment along x. If you mix px and py, you will get a spin moment along z. You can also apply this analysis to the d orbitals and you obtain this complex connection chart. I won't enter in the details, but I want to emphasize that orbital mixture at interfaces leads to non-trivial spin texture in momentum space, leading to fascinating effects such as the Rajba effect and the jaworzynski moria interaction. In the previous example, I showed that in the diatomic chain with p orbitals extended along x, I expect a spin moment along y and proportional to the sinus of kxa. So close to the gamma point, when the momentum is small, this means that Sy is proportional to Kx. I can generalize this result and say that in the simple case of an interface with the highest symmetry, the spin moment S is aligned perpendicular to the linear momentum K and is proportional to Z cross K. The first consequence of this spin momentum locking was identified in the late 70s in the context of semiconducting two-dimensional electron gas by Vasco and Rajba. If you consider an itinerant electron flowing along such an interface, then its spin will experience an effective magnetic field called the Rajba field, and it will align perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the electron. In other words, this effect results in a Zeeman term that couples the itinerant electron spin with the Rajba field. This coupling can result in non-equilibrium spin density. The existence of the so-called Rajba spin splitting was identified experimentally at the surface of gold using angle-resolved photoemission spectroscopy by Lachelle and co-workers in 1996. Another important consequence is called the jaworzynski moria interaction. Consider two neighboring local magnetic moments lying at this interface. Because the electron block state possess non-vanishing orbital moment, its spin needs to find a way to align along both the magnetic moments and the orbital moment. Of course, this is not possible. So to minimize the energy of the system, the two magnetic moments will tend to cant away from each other to minimize the energy and compensate the influence of the orbital moment. This canting is called the jaworzynski moria interaction and is written in this form. A beautiful consequence of this interaction is the stabilization of chiral magnetic textures such as magnetic skirmions as shown in this groundbreaking picture taken by Tokura's group in 2010. This concludes this second lecture. If you are interested in these topics, Rajba interaction and Jaworzynski moria 
I encourage you to have a look at these reviews. In this second lecture, we have looked at the origin of magnetism in transition metals. We have seen that it emerges from Stoner's criterion that leads to the enhancement of magnetism at interfaces. We have also seen that when spin orbit coupling is present, it gives rise to several phenomena like magnetocrystalline anisotropy, Jonesy schema interaction, and Rajba effect at interfaces. So, bottom line, we understand when magnetism is coming from in metals. Now, let's look at how it behaves. In the third lecture, we are going to consider the statistical behavior of a collection of magnetic moments. By looking at their field and temperature dependence, we will see that we can characterize the magnetic order. Let's move on.